All right. Uh, welcome to Dev333, using Amazon CloudWatch for Amazon ECS resource monitoring at scale. I'm Brendan McFarland. I'm a platform cost engineer at Mapbox. So first, just going to start with the agenda for today, uh, giving you a brief introduction to Mapbox, in case you're not familiar with the company, and what we call platform cost engineering, which is a term we, we kind of just cooked up. Um, I think other people do similar functions at their companies, too, though. We'll talk through our move from EC2 to ECS. It really informs uh, how we use ECS at Mapbox, and also why uh, using CloudWatch to monitor it is an interesting problem for us. And we'll talk about ECS and the shared resource problem. The shared resource problem being we use clusters to run multiple applications and multiple teams all, all in one cluster, and uh, how that affects our, our monitoring space. How we use CloudWatch on ECS in general, and how we build a solution uh, with CloudWatch to, to figure out uh, the, the shared resource problem, the, the tasks running on our cluster, and breaking out discrete, discrete costs. Um, and we have some, some results, some lessons learned along the way. It didn't go perfect. And then I'll briefly talk about what's next at, at Mapbox. So Mapbox, we're a uh, platform for developers uh, who want to use location in their app. So whether you're you know, a mobile developer or web developer, if, if you have any need for location, we've got APIs for you, we have SDKs, and you can work with Mapbox uh, to put in navigation or maps or, or you know, geolocation searches. So the primary APIs of Mapbox uh, would be maps. That's uh, when you think of you know, tiles. Um, an example would be you know, something as simple as maybe you're a pizza business and you want a store locator. And with Mapbox, Maybe you're a pizza business that only delivers by water. You could take you know, all the roads off your map, just show water. You can change the colors to match your color scheme. You can really do anything you want with our, our base layer. We open it up to customization by designers or developers. Uh, navigation, getting from point A to point B, uh, which you know, is, a, is a big deal these days. There's all sorts of ride sharing. There's you know, getting your deliveries um, and search. So geolocation, if you have an address or you have latitude, longitude, and you need the opposite. Uh, we have an API for that, too. Some of our big customers, the Weather Channel, they use us for uh, custom map styles. Uh, they'll use us in mobile, they'll use us in web, and uh, they'll display on top of it all sorts of styles with you know, Dopplers, um, and we handle the traffic you know, if a hurricane's coming in. And uh, they're, one, they're one of our big ones, for sure. And Tableau, if you have custom data sets in Tableau, and you can bring in your own Mapbox license and do, do things like 3D, you know, 3D uh, data visualizations, if you have population density and you want something really gripping beyond, you know, a spreadsheet, uh, you, can, you can use Map, Mapbox. So uh, as we've grown, this is, has enabled our other products. So we're at the point where we now have live traffic. We're in enough mobile apps that are reporting back telemetry that we can tell you where traffic is bad, where it's good, and uh, you can't really do routing these days without traffic. So uh, we also have a, a traffic API. And, and that level of telemetry also keeps our, our map up to date. So this is, this is telemetry traces around Washington, D.C. And if there's road closures, or let's say maybe there's a road missing, we'll know pretty quickly. It can be flagged by, by having telemetry where we don't think there are roads, or not having telemetry where we usually have lots of it. And uh, Mapbox has been on AWS since it started. At this point, we're at thousands of customers. We're in thousands of mobile applications. Uh, we have hundreds of millions of daily active users. And uh, we collect over 3 billion location probes a day, 100 million miles of anonymized telemetry every day. All of this consumes trillions of compute seconds on Amazon ECS every day. And I tell you this not to, to sell you on Mapbox, although Mapbox is great. If you want to use location, like go for it. But this is more to set the stage that on ECS, we're doing a lot. We have you know, all these APIs running at the same time. We have processing clusters as well. Uh, and we really lean on ECS for, for our production workloads. So what's platform cost engineering at Mapbox? Uh, platform cost engineering, top role is really cost monitoring and, and getting information out. Uh, I think our AWS bill had like 34 services last month, and how much we use each one changes rapidly. You know, each service will come out with new products, and, and just keeping tabs and, and informing back to our stakeholders what's happening in the AWS bill, and watching for maybe somebody you know turned up a stack for load testing, forgot to turn it back down. We want to tell them right away. Uh, platform cost engineering. It's also on the on-call rotation. I think I'm on level two right now, so hopefully nothing big happens. Um, 
but where it's just like any other you know, site reliability engineer. And we found that when our servers are having trouble, if you're getting alarms, that's often when you're also spending the most money. So, and it's, it's the high human capital cost as well. If you're really on call, you start to learn that tuning down a, you know, a cluster and then getting five alarms every day is gonna cost you a lot in, on the human side that you might not see if you're just looking at your bill every week. Um, and consulting with stakeholders is important. So it's a, a service team, it's a support role. Like Mapbox, business is not, is not cheap platform. Mapbox's business is providing like key location APIs to, to everyone. And innovating and advancing is, is also part of it. It's part of the whole platform team. They spearheaded the ECS, uh, ECS migration and um, platform is about making sure that our, our teams are pushing the boundaries of how you're using cloud. So the principles uh, of cost engineering informing and empowering stakeholders. It's about our product teams. It's about you know, keeping finance in the loop, keeping leadership in the loop making sure everyone has the, the data they need to make decisions. Stewardship of resource usage, so it's not just enough to monitor. If you notice something is going, you know, going astray, you need to take action, let people know, and, and don't just say, well, I know that that, that API is running too hot, but it's, it's not my API, like, we're, we're watching it. And then the term, the x-axis is coming. So that's what this uh, complex graph is all about. Um, so scale at Mapbox. Uh, whenever we're thinking about scale, uh, you can put it on these two axes. So scale of growth would be along the X here, and scale of, of our resource usage would be on the Y. So a simple one would be how many servers you have to serve a certain number of customers. And you can go a couple different ways on this graph. Maybe you need one server for every customer. And you know, that's, that could be okay for your business model. We try to do, do better than that. We really try to avoid a situation where you end up needing more resources as you get further along the scale graph, because this will potentially kill your business, essentially. So what, what we're really aiming for is scale where our, we're, we're below linear. And as we add, you know, if we double our customers, we really don't want to double our servers. We want to have an infrastructure that, that responds well to that scale. Sometimes there's a little investment ahead of time. You know, you'll incur costs before you, you see them back, but in the long term, if you know growth is coming, and we just assume it is, because if it doesn't come, that's a whole other problem, and it's not our problem. So we're ready for growth at all times, and, and we're looking to, to have scale at that point. So resources could be anything. You know, it could be servers, your engineers, your AWS cost, how many alarms you're getting, because that'll burn out your, you know, you can only get so many alarms before you burn out your team. And on the scale side, you're gonna add customers. You know, requests could double as you onboard a massive customer. Uh, your product teams are gonna come out with new applications, new APIs, and all that. Your resources, you want them to, to stay under linear. So that was part of, of what ECS was about at Mapbox. We were primarily on EC2 and auto scaling groups. Uh, about a year ago, we moved uh, solely to ECS for our production systems. So why did we move to ECS? Um, these are some of the more obvious benefits. I actually, Franca at, at Mapbox is giving a talk on Friday uh, solely about ECS benefits that are maybe a little less obvious, so you should check it out if, if you're very interested in ECS. Um, but you get lower costs. Ideally, you get better utilization. You know, you can right-size your containers easier than you can right-size an EC2. Uh, it's on spot by default across our company, so our clusters are 100% spot. Uh, unless there's, you know, a massive spot market problem, we're running on spot, and if our, our production teams are running on our platform clusters, they're on spot by default, and they're running at a low cost, and centralized capacity. So if you're running auto scaling groups for every application, your capacity starts getting very spread out, and you're managing a lot of different auto scaling groups, and you're trying to figure out, you know, why, why did instance towers go up twice as much this month? Well, this happened in this auto scaling group, this happened in this auto scaling group, and instead, you can move into these clusters. It's a little easier to keep tabs on overall what's, what's moving at your company. Efficient operations, so you can separate some infrastructure from code. Uh, your developers are worried about you know, writing with Docker, they're writing for containers. They're not concerned that, well, if I'm writing on, on this C3, then I don't have disk initialization, so my code needs to be concerned with EC2. You really, you move that away, and you can develop locally. Uh, it creates a uniform infrastructure across the company. You don't have to, to develop in a different way on a different product team, so teams can communicate a bit better in the code. People are more familiar. Security and credentialing, you have a, a smaller base uh, of rolling out security updates. So instead of a ton of auto-scaling groups, if, if you have a problem, you can roll out your update to one cluster, and you know you've got everything. And then just the local development environments you get out of using containers. So Mapbox before ECS, 
our services were in these auto-scaling groups. You had you know, the map service, you knew what instances matched with that. Uh, our search service was in one, and, and directions in another is our like, API examples. And post-ECS, we have one production API cluster. It's, it's running across multiple regions, um, but a typical one, there'll be more APIs in this, but they're all running across this, this mix of instance types. The instance types are all spot. And we, uh, we go for instance diversity with our spot fleets, primarily because we're, stability is what we're interested in as opposed to buying just the cheapest instance at, at that time. So we really try to make sure we have a spread out variety of instances that helps us if, say, you are losing a lot of one instance type and you, can, you know you can seamlessly move over to another instance pool that really helps you on, on the stability side. When you're using spot, your options are you know, to have multiple, be in multiple AZs and multiple instance types. So having both of those uh, is key to having a lot of instance pools to bid in and, and get stability and know that you're going to have the capacity you need. You also get uh, improved instance packing. So if, if you're like Mapbox at all, you probably have some CPU-heavy services and maybe some memory-heavy services. And when you combine those on ECS, you can get pretty radical savings. A recent example for us was we run our own uh, caching application. And a lot of our APIs are more CPU intensive, and the caching application just wants tons of memory. So you know our cluster was a little more CPU bound. We had a lot of leftover memory when we migrated this caching service from an EC2 autoscaling group onto ECS. It was basically the cost went away. I mean, it's still consuming resources on ECS, but that was memory that we weren't using well yet. And when you're combining CPU and memory, you can see, see really good utilization. So what's the shared resource problem with ECS? Like, why, why is this a problem? Why is there a talk today about using CloudWatch to monitor ECS? Why can't, you know, just use the standard metrics? Um, so before ECS, uh, if, if you had a MAPS instance in an autoscaling group, that was a MAPS instance. It booted up in this autoscaling group. It got tagged, API MAPS, and you could go and look at the bill at the end of the month, and you'd be, well, these instances were all tagged API MAPS. Looks like MAPS was 100 bucks this month. And you could go tell the MAPS team, you could tell your investors, you can calculate margin. It's pretty easy. After ECS, you have a cluster, and these instances are getting tagged to the cluster. So the instances spin up, and you, you'll tag them, well, this is, this is our API cluster instance. And, and on that cluster, you're running, you're running MAPS, you're running directions, you're running search all at the same time. You want to put in strict rules on how they're matching together. You want them to kind of organically find their home in this cluster. And anything could be happening on that instance. In the same day, that instance could run maps all in the morning, then it could run maps plus directions, and then at night, it's only running search. And how do you know what the cost of your applications are at that point? So you know the bill of your cluster, because you know, well, we have these cluster instances, they're all tagged, API cluster, and we know there's a lot of stuff running on the cluster, but we're not really sure what's, what's driving cost. And this isn't even really a problem with the tagging, I mean, you can't, there's no tag you could apply to, the, to an instance that's getting spun up on this cluster that would, would reflect that it's, it ran maps for 12 hours and then it ran directions for three and then it ran geocoding for seven. Like, you need dynamic tags. That sounds like a, a disastrous idea. Um, so you're still missing part of the picture because tags are at cluster level. You got multiple teams in this cluster and you, you can't report back to the teams. They don't know, hey, I, I shipped this change. I'm really excited about it. I think I've dropped our memory utilization. Like, what are our costs looking like? And, and you, don't, you don't necessarily know unless, unless you put in some extra work. So we really needed service and task uh, resource consumption within our ECS environment. So ECS is great. We still love ECS, even though we had this problem. Uh, it's just a whole different monitoring space. And it makes some previously basic questions a little harder. So basic question, maybe finance comes to you and says, hey, how much was MAPS this month? We want to put it in the board report. Uh, it's gonna, you're gonna have to do some work to get to that answer. Uh, so there are kind of two ways you could go at this point. It's like one, why don't you just create the same monitoring environment that you had before in auto-scaling groups? So just do one cluster for one service and one cluster for one team, and that doesn't sound like a great idea because you're gonna be adding tons of clusters, you're losing a lot of the benefits of ECS, it's not, it's not the, the scaling you're looking for. Um, so instead, you can build a CloudWatch system, uh, build a pipeline to track this resource consumption. You only have to build it once. It'll work for all your clusters, and you're, you're not splitting everything up, and you can really see the benefits of ECS this way. So ECS plus CloudWatch. Out of the box uh, with, with CloudWatch, you'll get, get a few ECS metrics, uh, which are really important. 
at the cluster level, you'll get your resource consumption. You get CPU utilization, CPU reservation. So reservation is what the tasks are saying they need. Utilization is reflecting what the tasks are, are actually using. Uh, if you're starting your, your tasks with services, if they're managed by services, you also get it at the service level. Uh, at Mapbox, we have sort of a hybrid environment. Most of the APIs are, are started by services. A lot of the data processing is more of like a, an SQSQ, and they're being started by the run task API, so you're not gonna have this metric for them. So we also put in a lot of custom metrics to help Mapbox uh, figure out what's happening on ECS. At the moment, I think we're at 31. I put a star because people are always kind of spinning up a new metric. Um, some examples of custom metrics we use, ECS agent connected percent. Uh, the ECS agent will occasionally disconnect from, from instances on your cluster. This is okay at a small, at a small level, but if, if a lot of, of agents are disconnecting, you're gonna wanna, wanna know. So that's, that's an example of an alarm. We set up these custom metrics and we'll alarm on some of them. Failed task placements, if people are asking for space on your cluster and they're not getting space, you're gonna wanna know before your product teams and, and uh, have the cluster respond to it. Active instance count, uh, spot termination, those kind of things are very important for us as we're running on spot fleet. We wanna know what type instances are running, we wanna know how many, and it can sometimes diagnose like, oh, we have a spot outage, that's why there was this blip in services and they were all just moving over to, to a new instance pool. So that's a lot of metrics. Uh, how do we, like, we have a lot of clusters still because we're running in many regions. Like, how do you keep track of all these metrics? Uh, we use dashboards. So AWS CloudFormation will let you set up a CloudWatch dashboard for each cluster. Uh, and it's, it's really helpful. It's been super helpful for me whenever I'm trying to diagnose anything that we did this um, because whenever a cluster is spun up, you get a default dashboard that spins up too based on the code we have in our CloudFormation templates. So I, I put a little code snippet here. Uh, the CF references, you can also check out Mapbox CloudFriend, which is an open source uh, module that makes writing CloudFormation a little easier. You can use it in JavaScript. You don't have to write massive JSON files. Um, so generally, the dashboard is, is gonna be a lot of widgets. So this is an example uh, of like the default uh, metrics showing up on a widget. So CPU reservation, memory reservation, um, and, and a code snippet uh, of the actual widget. That's the, the snippet that's resulting in that graph. So on our dashboard, we have this graph for every cluster, and you can navigate through the console, look at all your clusters. We also show a lot of the custom metrics. You know, we have instance type there. We have some scaling up and scaling down rules. So these dashboards are great, and they give us a great picture of what's happening on ECS, but we're still not there to this, this like maps resource consumption problem. How much did maps cost? Some reasons why we're not there yet. We have 10 plus clusters. We have 10 plus spot fleet mixes. Very different task pro profiles are running on all these clusters, services and run task. So you got a lot of variables, um, but we, at this point, we knew the data we needed to collect uh, to, to figure this out. So you want to know how long your tasks are running on the cluster. If you know how, how long they're running, you get a duration. At that point, you also have a task reservation, what they were asking for. So that's the resources. And you can figure out the cost of your cluster. You're still getting those instances tagged to the cluster. You'll get your, your bill, whatever you're using, if you're using a, you know, a cloud ability or a cloud checker, or if you're looking at the Cost Explorer DBR on your own. Either way, you can pull out the tag cluster cost. So if you determine how long the task ran, how much memory, CPU, you can include disk. That's, that's like a whole other conversation on how, how you should actually cost the task when there's you know, disk, CPU, memory, and network all on this cluster. For this talk, we're just talking about memory and CPU. Um, but anyway, so if you have resources and duration and the cost of the cluster, you can get to that task sort of allocated percentage cost. So the hardest part was recording task duration. And this is our first attempt at it. We relied on CloudWatch event rules. Uh, which is whenever a task is starting or stopping or having some state change, you can write a CloudWatch event rule to record that. So it's all kicked off by CloudWatch event rules. Uh, we sent them to Kinesis Firehose, which will collect a bunch of them, prevent your S3 from getting hammered by all these, these tiny put objects. Um, it goes to S3. We wrote a Lambda after that to you know, pick up this, this Firehose object, do some, some ETL work on it, drop it back on S3, uh, and then use Amazon Athena to, to query off S3. If you set up a table definition, uh, it's sort of a, the quickest way to, to really get a, a database up and running. Um, so this was our first attempt, and we ran into some problems with it. Uh, so our infrastructure is running in, I think, seven ECS regions right now, 
And Kinesis Firehose is not supported in every ECS region. So we had this situation where we wanted a Firehose in every ECS region, and we just couldn't do it. Um, and then we also noticed the volume of start and stop events. When you're running thousands of tasks, particularly on processing, you, you know, you're invoking a lot of lambdas there, you got a lot of fire hoses, started to worry about, about the costs. Um, so take two, we built a sort of split off the task start and stop event, the CloudWatch event rule, and the lambda, deployed them to every ECS region, even ones we're not running in yet, just in case somebody spins up a cluster, we don't know about it, we want to be recording already. Um, and connected them to a global firehose. So that firehose is in US East 1. It, it takes events from around the world, all our ECS regions, and writes them to S3. Because we had this Lambda earlier on, we don't need to do any ETL work after. It sends it to the firehose in, in a format that, that is readable by Athena once it gets written to S3. So we can see our start and stop events as they're happening uh, with Athena. So we had duration. We had the start and stop events at this point. Resources reserved is uh, not too complicated. Uh, there's, again, you can set up a CloudWatch event rule to record whenever a task definition is created. That task definition will have your CPU. It'll have your memory. If you have, um, which is what you need for, for this, this like initial resource calculation. Uh, you can't tag task definitions yet, so we just built a little module that we put in all our code when people are writing task definitions to, to format their, the names of their services for them. So we know our services are coming across right now named as you know, service, team, cost category, and then a suffix if they, if they wanted to have additional information in their task definition. The, so that was our resource usage pipeline. The cost pipeline, we're just doing a simple, when there's a bucket notification, an ECS task. A bucket notification from when the, the bill drops on S3, an ECS task picks it up, um, partitions it out across S3, and then we can query it on Athena pretty rapidly. So we had, we had duration, we had resources uh, reserved, and we had task, at that point, we can get to the task resource cost, because we have the cost. Uh, but at this point, kind of taking a pause, because there's some limitations. First off, we realized, like, how much is this entire pipeline about to cost us? Like, how much are we spending just to figure out our spending? Um, and uh, we had a lot of task volume, which was the big part of it. And then we're using Athena, it's a new service, and there's some strategies you really want to use on Athena to make sure you keep your costs down. Uh, the social impacts of the information, you're also getting this, this data out to teams, maybe at a level they didn't even have before with the auto-scaling groups, because you're excited about the information, you're gonna say, hey, like, guess what, that new like, directions task just cost us $5,000 yesterday. Like, getting that information out, you wanna make sure that you're explaining why, because you don't wanna change the behavior of your engineering team without sort of thinking about it. Like, there's definitely a social aspect to this. And then there's a, an extremely high cost if you send this information out and it turns out it's wrong. Like, you do not want faulty information in this pipeline, and there were a lot of moving pieces that we just showed. So just starting with the massive task uh, volume, one of our engineers, actually, Ryan Clark, built, built this little tool to let you uh, play around with ECS um, uh, CloudWatch events, sorry. So with the, the CloudWatch events, you can set up, in this case, like a temporary rule over here, uh, and then start listening, and you'll get a bunch of CloudWatch events showing up. So this is really helpful. You want to filter your ECS task state changes. You only want to get the ones, like you don't want to record duplicates. You only want to get start and stops. Um, in particular, we were recording at one point EC2 uh, events. And if you record EC2 uh, state change events, you'll also record every time a task like comes off and on the container as, a part of, as opposed to just when it starts and stops. So there's some gotchas in the events. Uh, and you just want to make sure you're only recording what you need, especially if you have high task volume. Then there's the Athena side. So we set up this, this sort of data warehouse on S3. Uh, your first part is S3 costs, which should be pretty low. Um, even with, with writing all this data, our S3 costs are, are super minimal on this. The Athena costs can be a bit more. So Athena, you are charged on how much you query. So I think it's $5 a terabyte. So the keys around Athena, you really want to partition your data. That means spreading it out into multiple subdirectories. We, we just did by date and time, which works well in this recording system because everything is sort of based around duration and time in the first place. So you really know around what, what time you're going to want to be querying. And then compression, make sure you're writing compressed files. And then sort of education on anyone who might be querying this. So we, we built a little Slack pot uh, when we first started spinning up uh, Athena that if someone runs a particularly large query, it will tell everyone, like, hey, a massive query just finished. Uh, which is sometimes fine, but it also gets people realizing, like, hey, pushing that button 
if you're querying our whole S3 bucket, you could spend a lot of money really fast. Um, so you just want to keep tabs on, on what's happening on Athena. And then the, the social part of it. So you, you want to make sure you're empowering your teams and not punishing them uh, when, you're, when you're spreading out data like this. Big numbers initially can be scary. You want your engineering team still trying to innovate. You don't want them afraid of using resources. You're trying to get them, get them active. Uh, and so for us, it's important to stress that the idea here is to create like a healthy system of monitoring. Uh, from your monitoring, you want to learn from it. So you want to say, oh, I just found out that like Maps uses half our cluster. Like, what does that tell me? Um, you also want to say, like, I just noticed that maybe directions spike last week. You can go talk to directions about what changed. Like, maybe their new change they didn't realize was resource intensive. It's also great where you can get a victory back to a team. So if they've done something that they think will make their service scale better or run better, if you report back, yeah, your request went up, you know, double, and your cost didn't at all. Like, great job. Um, so first part is monitoring, learning from it, and then taking action, and then going right back to monitoring. It's just a cycle that essentially will never, never stop. Around the high cost of faulty information, uh, alarms are important. You want to know if all of a sudden you're missing events. Like, if you're missing start and stop events, you can have tasks that appear to be running forever because you missed the stop events. So definitely want alarms on. There's also some, some ETL queries that are you know, running everything that's actually matching these start and stop events for each task. So you want to make sure that those run properly every day. Uh, and you want to know before maybe your, cost, your automated cost reporting that posts every week posts erroneous data because it's missing a day. So you want to get alarms if anything breaks here, essentially. Uh, they don't need to wake you up, but you, you probably want to get an email or have it in the Slack channel, and so you can be able to fix it before you send anything out that might be faulty to stakeholders. So that's just making sure you're regularly checking in because you're probably not going to log in and check to see how your, like, your data... Um, your start and stop event query ran like each day. You want to know that it failed without having to, to log in and check. Um, so results for Mapbox. Uh, we got to, to the, the cost of container that we wanted. Uh, we had task level detail uh, within our clusters. You can tell how much geocoding or how much navigation or any, or any one of the other services is using overall on the cluster. And we, uh, you also get a queryable start and stop event database out of this, which, which can end up being pretty useful for debugging and just various things. If you know an instance on your cluster had a lot of trouble and you want to know what was running on it then, you can you know, pull up a quick query to see, see what tasks were on it for that hour or that minute or when it was having uh, an issue. And that might give you a suspect list if you, if you don't have anything to go on. So around the costing containers, how it works, you'll know like container Y, you have the start and stop event, you have the duration. It ran for 112 seconds on, say, cluster Z. Container Y reserves a certain amount of CPU and memory. Here we did 1024. You can assign a cost to, to those uh, resources. So in this case, I'm just showing an only CPU example. Uh, we actually combine CPU and memory when we're, we're figuring out the cost uh, of a task. But you'll know on, on cluster Z, let's say it had you know, 10,000 CPU seconds over the day and the cluster cost you a dollar. You'll know how much that CPU second from there, cost from there. You can multiply it by, by that container reservation, and, and you'll get a final cost for that container. I'll say if your CPU seconds cost that much, that's, that's a real problem. They're usually like way into the scientific notation. Um, so you're, you're dealing with uh, very small numbers, but as you roll them up, you start to really see the picture uh, of your overall services. So how do we report these back? Uh, CloudWatch uh, is, is another part of this. So we have a scheduled Lambda that, that runs Athena queries and will write sort of the higher level cost numbers to CloudWatch. So teams can see maybe they have an application dashboard where they're watching like maps utilization and just services and their deployment in general, you can, you can throw the cost of maps right on that dashboard if you want. Um, so that, we have a picture here, which is just the, the overall teams uh, over, over a couple of days. I always like when graphs go this way uh, in cost. you kind of looking for the opposite. Um, an example of an API directions change. So they push a change, and a couple of days later, you see the cost has actually gone down. Uh, we quickly realized, though, you don't want to log every, every detail you're getting back from this pipeline into CloudWatch, because you'll be spending a lot on CloudWatch at that point. If you're, if you're doing every task specific cost, A, probably no one's going to look at this information. Generally, you don't really care what one task costs. You care, let's say, you know that you care what, what the rolled up. So every task that was, was a maps task, you want that rolled up. So you want to you write the rolled up amount. You're not looking to write a, a single task amount there. So not, not every detail is logged to CloudWatch. 
but it's all queryable uh, with Athena. So some of the other reports we use that, that uh, aren't CloudWatch are shown here. Um, because we can roll up the cluster by task or by service or by team or by task uh, cast category, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can slice this. So on processing production, this is just an example. It's small to see, but each of these colors is a team. So you could say, you can look at each cluster and say, this is what's driving, what team is driving cost on, on this particular cluster. And let's say maybe it was the data team that was driving it. You can then pull out the services that are tagged to that data team. And you know, there's, there's a likely culprit here in this orange line if they're looking to know what, is, what has changed in their services. So there's a lot of different, different ways to slice these reports when you have by task, by service, by team, and uh, by cost category. So some of the immediate benefits for Mapbox. We could answer the how much did my application cost this month, uh, which made our finance team very happy and also made our engineering teams happy because you really want to know what the bottom line impact of your work is. Um, it also helped us answer some questions like, why is the EC2 bill more expensive? So instead of just saying, well, I know this cluster costs more, you can actually diagnose why that cluster costs more, like what was using more capacity, what needed more CPU and memory, and what changed from this month to last month other than those top level numbers. Uh, we actually send now usage bills out to our stakeholder teams on ECS. So every week, you know, the satellite team will get a list of the services. Uh, how much CPU and memory they each used, and then what that translated to in cost, which is helpful because you know we'll have cost fluctuations that are based on the spot market, and there's nothing a team can do about it, and then there's also cost fluctuations that are based on resources. So it's helpful to expose both to teams so they know, oh, you know, I pushed a change that's, that's using more CPU, or, oh, the spot market was bad, I shouldn't really worry about this cost change yet, but it's still helpful for them to know that you know, we're dealing with this uh, variability. Um, and our, our clusters are still organized for engineering. So we still have an API cluster. We still have a processing cluster. We haven't had to make any moves where we're putting maps solely on a maps cluster so we can easily report back what maps is doing. Instead, we can run these things together. We can run our caching service with them. And, and we can reap the engineering benefits of ECS at, at their fullest. So we also found it put a focus on right-sizing for our teams. So when you start getting charged on your task reservation, you might take a second look at what you're reserving. If you're reserving more, more memory than you need, uh, you can pretty quickly change your reservation, a different cost will be calculated for you, and uh, our cluster will run more efficiently because we don't have tasks over reserving. Uh, luckily, we haven't run into anyone just you know, setting reservations way too low and breaking our cluster. Everyone at Mapbox is a, is a positive player, um, but we have built some tools that, that make it easy to query utilization versus the, the reservation on ECS, so we can compare this uh, and, and inform teams that, hey, maybe you're over-reserved, maybe you're under-reserved, um, but it, it put a little more focus back on right-sizing of a task. Uh, some of the, a little more unexpected was, was the debugging benefits of this. So on ECS, when tasks are, are looking to be placed, one of the, one of the things that can happen is a, a failed task placement. And it's not always clear. Maybe your cluster is only 60% reserved and you don't know why this task is failing to place. Uh, we, we were actually able to replay start and stop events on a specific instance. And if you know this instance is failing tasks, um, why? You know, you're looking back later, you can say, you can look and say, well, this instance was running these 12 tasks and then maybe four tasks tried to place and it turns out that was more than could fit. Um, so it's helped us to, to work with the, the ECS task scheduler and, and sort of play around with, with the scale there. And um, debugging instance events. So separate from the task placement, you also could have a situation where maybe a task is, is really hammering one of the resources that isn't as well tracked by your metrics. So let's say disk utilization. And we know that, that the disk utilization of a box is going up to 100%, and then all of a sudden it drops off when some tasks stop. It's really great to be able to look back at those couple seconds and see what tasks stopped. Because that's, that's a pretty quick, uh, indication of potentially the task that is causing your disk utilization problem. So we've done that uh, a couple times, and, it, and it's helped. So what's next at Mapbox? Um, what we really want to do is get more utilization data linked with this billing data. So I mentioned that we have some, some tooling around ECS utilization of, on, on task reservations. So if a task reserves two cores, we'd love to also show next to its cost report and what it's using say, well, by the way, your task is reserving two cores and you're usually using one and a half. That's, that's probably pretty good, but maybe they're reserving 10 cores and they're usually using one. Um, 
it's not a super simple metric because you still want to have some, some you know, reporting around the max. Maybe their, their task is spiking all the time but has a low average. But, but getting utilization and billing tightly linked ideally leads to, to better, better utilization and better efficiency on the cluster. And we actually want to follow this model with a lot more of our, our large AWS products. So when we started on this initiative, ECS was kind of lagging behind what we could tell, tell our teams. You know, we could tell them a lot more about what was happening on S3 or Lambda or you know, some of the other AWS services that are big for us. Um, and now ECS is kind of, you know, it's at the top. It's the one that teams are, are getting every week and, and seeing what's happening. So we want to add S3 to this. We want to add Lambda to this. Um, so we're rolling out more of, of this team reporting across products. And, and then we want to add some, some more alarming and monitoring. So it, it kind of woke up uh, us to the fact that we're still a little manual on, on looking at, at the bill every week. And uh, you know, as I was going through and sort of diagnosing, oh, this is happening on S3, or our ECS costs are here, there are some patterns that emerged um, on how you would dig into any AWS resource. So if you know the resource went up, um, any product, let's say you know ECS went up by double, um, you could initially just start doing some queries, uh, slicing, slicing that product by, let's say, by the team or by the cluster tag and, and just automatically get a report back without having to do this, this manual um, data sort of digging. Um, so we're working on, on a, sort of a suite around that. So as our bill goes up, we'll automatically get sort of a ping back that's like, your bill is up 5% today, it's up 2% in ECS, um, of that, it's like 50% of that is on the API production cluster in Southeast One, and Geocoder is running twice as much. Like, you could automate that um, if you built some queries with some logic behind them to, to pick out sort of the highest diffs, and, and they're intelligently slicing your data. Uh, and just the last thing, um, with all these products, with every, everything happening, uh, Mapbox is, is always growing. So what's, uh, what's next for Mapbox? Um, we're looking for, always looking for talented individuals, uh, I stole a snippet from our website here, but I really would emphasize that we're not always looking for the traditional background. Um, I started in finance personally uh, when I was at Mapbox, um, and since then I've actually moved into this engineering role, um, and we really look for people who are passionate about interesting problems as opposed to potentially checking every box on, on a job application. So, so check out Mapbox Jobs. Um, that's it for, for my talk. Thanks, thanks everyone for coming this morning.